So we're going to have a little bit of a change in schedule. Uh, Senator Rand Paul is fulfilling his constitutional duty to uh, vote. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward with J.D. Vance. Uh, J.D. Vance is an investor, a commentator, and the author of the number one best-selling Hillbilly Elegy, uh, described by National Review as a brilliant book and by The Economist as one of the most important reads of 2016. And honestly, I'm going to stop reading from his formal bio because I think um, specifically to us at American Moment, J.D. is um, so much more than anything that could be uh, encapsulated in a formal bio. It was a piece that he wrote in the American mind almost two years ago that inspired us to create this organization. He's a mentor. He's a, a, a board member of American Moment. And um, he has been on the forefront of defining in the public sphere the rhetoric, the policy, the ideas, and the way we communicate with people about all number of issues, whether it's immigration, whether it's trade, whether it's the culture, whether it's foreign policy. He has exhibited real courage, and he's exhibited real courage, especially in the last couple of months, where all of the incentives in American life have aligned to make it so that you should shut up and listen to what the establishment in Washington has to say about this foreign policy crisis. Uh, so he's going to come and lay out his vision of uh, what a conservative foreign policy doctrine should look like. So please give a round of applause for J.D. Vance. So uh, Saurabh asked me, first of all, Saurabh and Nick, thanks to, to you and the team for putting on an important conference, I think a very important moment in our nation's history. Uh, Saurabh asked me to talk about American foreign policy uh, he also asked me to speak at 1, and so I was going to prepare my exact remarks from 12.30 to 1. And uh, because Rand Paul is late, I told him I would go on earlier. So I'm just going to stand up here and riff for a little bit. And I thought what I'd do, instead of like trying to create some grand uh, strategy up here for the conservative movement, is i just make a couple of observations about what's going on, and then I'll take some questions from the audience if you guys are so inclined. So, you know, first is um, I, I'm a Senate candidate, and I'm running the state of Ohio. We have a primary on May 3rd. And one of the, the really interesting things that's happened in, in the course of this candidacy is there are all of these issues that consultants and other people who are familiar with this stuff tell you you're not supposed to touch, right? There are certain things you're just not allowed to talk about. Uh, the big three that you're often told as a candidate you're not allowed to talk about are trade, immigration, uh, and foreign policy. And I'm sort of, I guess, on the opposite of the establishment consensus on all those issues. And I've made my, you know, my Senate campaign now, I think, very focused on being on the opposite side on all these issues. But I will say that uh, very interesting to me is that foreign policy is uniquely uh, dangerous. Um, it is kind of okay to be on the, uh, the wrong side of the consensus on trade. It's kind of okay to be on the wrong side of the consensus on immigration. But if you are on the wrong side of the foreign policy consensus in this town, uh, it is remarkable how much the media organs of both the establishment right and the left will go after you. Uh, even donors, right? The first time that I've actually ever had donors push back against all the crazy things that I say over the course of my Senate campaign um, is on this Russia-Ukraine thing, right? The craziest idea that I've had in, these, in, this, in, in the last year and a half since I've been running for the Senate since July 1st, I guess about a year then, the craziest idea that I've had is that we should not get involved in a nuclear war with Russia, right? That's... That is the truly dangerous idea. That's the reason uh, that my candidacy is, is in particular uh, very threatening to a lot of the people who make opinion and make a lot of money in this town. So uh, that's one thing that I've noticed. And I thought a lot about why this is. Like, why is it that foreign policy is the sort of the thing that you're not supposed to touch? Uh, why is it that expressing the views that I think you're hearing a lot in this conference, and I would assume most of you in the audience share, like, what's going on there, okay? And there are a couple of, of things here. You know, one is a straightforward financial incentive, okay? Uh, uh, this is not a fun thing to talk about or to acknowledge is going on. It's something that if you told me this was going on 10 or so years ago, I probably would have said, well, that's crazy. That's not actually happening. But let's just be honest with ourselves. A lot of people get very rich when America goes to war. A lot of people get very rich when America funds wars in far-flung corners of the world. But not very many people get rich when America solves its biggest problems here at home, okay? Uh, nobody get, gets that wealthy if we go from having 110,000 opioid overdoses in this country to 80,000. Nobody gets very wealthy if the number of illegal border crossings goes from 250,000 to 50,000. But a lot of people get very wealthy when we get involved in military conflict. So I think it's, it's important to be honest about the financial incentive. 
But there's also something sort of very deep and ideological. Uh, and so just to give a little bit of background on my life, you know, I grew up in a working class family. It was sort of the first in my family to go to college. Uh, eventually found myself after the Marine Corps at Yale Law School. And, you know, I, I've said this before, but I'll, you know, repeat it for the benefit of all of you. The, 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 the thing that was most jarring about Yale Law School, it's not that it was left wing. Of course, it was more left wing than any institution I'd ever belonged to. Uh, but that was sort of expected. It was how narrow the band of acceptable thought was. There were very, very few things that you were allowed to believe at Yale Law School. And, and it created an environment th where, where instead of people feeling open and interrogating different ideas and having frank discussions about what was going on in the world, where you almost felt like you were being conditioned and accustomed to believe within that very narrow band of things. And, you know, the, the thing that's, that's weird about the Ivy League in this country is that people get an incredible amount of psychic benefit from having participated in it. Okay, if I'm being honest with myself, I, that was true of me too when I was, when I was in my, my mid-20s. It was like, yeah, you know, I felt very proud of myself for having gotten into this prestige institution. And that prestige is, I think, what makes that institution actually work, that social prestige, right? It doesn't give out interesting thoughts. Uh, the professors there are mostly boring. Some of them are totally crazy, and a few of them are interesting. What it does give out is social prestige, okay? And so uh, the reason that that institution and so many of the similar institutions, the Kennedy School and so forth, have so much influence is because we assume that the people who have gotten there are somehow better in some way, right? Uh, as ridiculous as that is, and as much as we all know in our heart, I think that it isn't true, there's this expectation that if you went to one of these fancy schools, you have something that other people don't have. Okay, certainly other people, certainly those in the job market, interviewers and so forth, assume that you're maybe more intelligent or they assume something else, but it's all social prestige and it's all signaling. Okay, it's all largely fake. Um, the, 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 the place where you hear the least amount of interesting thought, I would say, in the world is a place like Yale Law School, not the most, and yet... Uh, that place has a ton of social prestige. So I beat up on Bill Crystal recently because I don't think he went to Yale Law School, maybe he went to Yale undergrad. But, you know, in, in, in a normal, healthy, functioning country, uh, Bill Crystal would have become, you know, a mid-level enterprise sales associate at, um, at, at a firm in Encino, California, or San Mateo. Uh, instead, because he came from a, an, a family that had a lot of social prestige, I think his father was a very smart man, agree or disagree with him, and because he went to institutions that conferred more, uh, Bill Crystal's ideas eventually got thousands of Americans killed. Okay, So if there's a financial incentive on the one hand, there's a lot of money in being wrong about American foreign policy. There's also just a very deep ideological thing going on, where the people who participate in these institutions are never checked on it, they're never thrown off a of television. They're never made to feel ashamed for some of the things that they've accomplished. Uh, they just keep on participating, going through the motions. And somehow, you know, we're 20 years into, I think, the worst 20 years maybe in the history of American foreign policy. The same people who caused terrible disasters in Afghanistan and Iraq then caused terrible disasters in Libya and Syria. And now we're advocating for something that's going to work out this time. It's definitely going to work out this time if we just escalate uh, and escalate as much as possible over this Russian-Ukraine thing. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's, you know, it's, it's insane. Uh, but the reason that, th that, that those ideas exist, the reason that they're out there so much, is because there are a lot of ideological and financial incentives for them to be there. So one part of restoring sanity to American foreign policy is that we have to stop giving these institutions so much prestige and so much money. Okay, why is it that the Yale endowment pays 0% taxes uh, far higher than any working class member of my family? Why is it that George Soros's Open Society Foundation has been given preferential treatment from the government? If we think that doesn't have an effect, it certainly does, right? It continues to give these organs that cause a lot of bad ideas to percolate through our society, ensures they have an unlimited access of capital, and ultimately they use that capital and use that social prestige for some very negative things. So that, that's number one, is let's disconnect ourselves from the Kennedy School, from the grand strategy seminars at Yale. Let's accept that the people who have governed us and ruled over us for the past 20 or 30 years have done a preposterous job at it. We should stop giving them so much power, okay? That's sort of fact number one. Um, So observation number two, or fact number two, about America's foreign policy is that it's incredibly moral in its language, okay? And of course, I, I, I don't think that moral considerations should be completely 
uh, outside of how we think of our foreign policy. But just take, for example, the Iraq war. It's, it's one thing to accept that there's a moral dimension to foreign policy. It's another thing to view foreign policy through a purely moral dimension. Um, what's been going on in, or what, what happened in Iraq, right? Even today, when I talk to people about the Iraq war, I find uh, that the, the pro-Iraq argument, to the extent that it still exists, is really about we were liberating Iraq from this terrible person and we were giving freedom or we were at least trying to give freedom. Maybe it didn't work out so well, but we were at least trying to give freedom to an oppressed people. And then the anti-Iraq war argument was often framed in similarly moralistic language, right? It was an evil colonial incursion. We were just interested in killing a bunch of Iraqis so that we could get their oil. You know, the classic blood for oil slogan uh, that you know, a lot of you guys are too young, but we, I heard a lot in 2002 and 2003. Uh, but very rarely did I ever hear somebody step back and say, well, let's separate the moral dimension and ask ourselves, is this in America's strategic interest, right? What are the ins and outs? What are the, the, the unexpected things that might happen? Like, what are we actually going to accomplish by going into Iraq? And I see the same thing happening with Russia and Ukraine, okay? Uh, so, so, so often, I mean, 90%, turn on MSNBC or CNN, turn on major, almost any major media outlet, and the Russia war is framed in almost explicitly moralistic terms. Well, you know, I happen to think uh, that Russia should not have invaded Ukraine, okay? So fine, moral, morally condemn it all you want, but at the end of the day, our foreign policy needs to be a little bit more sophisticated than the guy in Russia is good, the guy in, U or sorry, the guy in Russia is bad, and the guy in Ukraine is good, okay? That may very well be true, but it doesn't lead to any foreign policy conclusions for the American people, for the American nation state, right? Uh, we need to be more sophisticated than that. What's actually in our interest here, right? What are we getting out of this? Okay, so we want to punish Russia. Okay, that's the moralistic response. We want to punish Russia. Well, how should we punish Russia? Should we, you know, put uh, a few ICBMs uh, on the border of Poland and Ukraine? Because that might lead to the destruction of the world. So maybe that's a bad idea, but that would be punishing Russia, okay? Uh, do we want to implement sanctions? Well, I've been supportive of some of the sanctions that we've done, but you know, sanctions, some of them are good and some of them don't make any sense, okay? Uh, what if we sanction fertilizer coming from Russia in such a way that doesn't affect the Russian economy at all, but makes food more expensive for American consumers, right? Is that a good idea? Okay, but this is where this moralistic way of thinking about foreign policy very often leads us astray. We try to do the thing that is good and just and right, but at the end of the day, American foreign policy makers need to be a little bit more strategic. Now, I've come under some fire in my campaign for saying that at the end of the day, I don't see Ukraine as in the vital national security interest in the country. And of course, everybody goes crazy and you know, says that I, I, that I hate these innocent people who are being killed by Vladimir Putin, and of course I don't, but at the end of the day, what I care about as an individual is separate from what I should care about as a foreign policy thinker or as a person. I'm running for the Senate, not just a thinker, but a person who, who means to actually make some foreign policy in this country. We have to separate the care and concern of policymakers from our care and concern as individuals. And at the end of the day, the moralistic way in which we've approached the Russia-Ukraine situation, I think it's been horrible for us. I think it's been even worse for the Ukrainians, probably not even good for the Russians either. It's good for no one when you let a bunch of people who can only think in moral terms and moral dimensions, you, you, you project their idiocy and their emotionalism on a situation that requires some strategic thought and some strategic consideration. I think that's, that's one of the things that's going on too. The final thing I'd say about, about American foreign policy, uh, or the final observation I'd make, is that American foreign policymakers are remarkably I mean, just terribly naive about the importance of culture and its role all across the globe uh, in our own country, but also in, in the countries that we, we interact with. So uh, I, I served four years in the Marine Corps. I was an enlisted guy. I went to, uh, Af sorry, I went to Haiti once, and then I went to Iraq for seven months. And you know, one of the assignments that I was given in Iraq is that we, you know, if you remember, this was in late 2005. And you may remember, you may have seen um, that, that the, the Iraqis were all dipping their finger in purple ink and holding it aloft, okay? So in October of 05, Iraq had uh, constitutional referendum elections, and then in December of 05, I believe they had some parliamentary elections. So one of the things I was asked to do is provide security, me and a, a group of other Marines were asked to provide security for a camp that housed Iraqi poll workers, right? As they were getting trained in how to run an election, as they were going out and running an election, doing all these things, which in, at the time, to their credit, were very dangerous. And I remember, you know, sleeping in this camp, and I was reading three books, 
Okay, one was this book called An End to Evil by Richard Pearl, sort of a neoconservative manifesto. Uh, the basic argument of the book is that American foreign policy could, could destroy tyranny and evil regimes all over the world. Think, think about the moral language built in there, complete lack of strategic language. Uh, the second book I read was by an Israeli scholar named Natan Sharansky. It was called The Case for Democracy. And the basic argument was democracies never fight one another. So if America just turns every, through war, if America turns every regime in the world into a democracy, then we won't have any more fighting left. And the third book that I read was The Complete Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And I, I remember this like very distinct feeling of none of this making any sense because the main issue that we had in this camp of Iraqi poll workers. I mean, I don't know how many, there were, there were a lot of them, hundreds probably, um, you know, pro probably three or 400 people that we were keeping control of. We were sort of providing security. We, we almost served as a, almost the policemen. We ensured that things didn't get too out of control uh, if, if people got a little rowdy. And the main problem, and it was all men in our camp, all men in our camp, the main problem that we confronted in Iraq, and these are the, you know, the, the, the beacons of democracy, the main problem was preventing sexual assaults from the older camp guard members against the younger camp guard members. Like that was, that was the main thing that I remember waking up in the morning thinking, we need to prevent more sexual assaults today, okay? And at the same time, I'm reading books about how this is going to be a great democratic experiment and using American military power, these people are going to turn the desert of Iraq into a you know, Western European style liberal democracy with just a few more dead Americans and a few more dollars of American tax money. And, and, I, and, and, and I remember having this like very distinct thought that you know, I'm reading this ridiculous fantasy book about you know, dragons and talking lions and witches and so forth. And it was more realistic about human nature than the two neoconservative books that I was reading in this Iraqi camp. And, you know, the thing that they missed, the thing that all of the people who are making policy in that particular moment missed is that you actually need to pay attention to culture, right? What is the nature of the country that we're trying to transform? What's its history linguistic, religious tradition, right? Who are the people who live here and do they want the foreign policy gifts that the United States comes to offer? Uh, John Mearsheimer, one of the great realist thinkers in American foreign policy, right? Um, he, like, if you look at what he was saying about the Russia and Ukraine situation in the lead up to Russia and Ukraine, he was basically asking for us to think about what these two distinct cultures meant, the way in which they interacted with each other, and the way in which each of them would respond to American involvement. And yet John Mearsheimer has been accused recently of being a Putin apologist for simply asking the basic question of who are we dealing with, what do they think about the world, and how might they react to American action? If that makes you a Putin apologist, then our foreign policy establishment is filled with idiots, okay? Because you can't ask the important questions. That's what's wrong with the American foreign policy establishment. You can't ask important questions. You can't push back against crazy ideas. And all the institutions that confer social prestige, including many, just to be fair, that I've been involved with, those institutions are fundamentally broken. That's basically what's wrong with American foreign policy. So uh, a very simple proposal is I'd like our foreign policy thinkers and leaders, our think tank officials and so forth, to stop talking in strictly moralistic language and more strategic language. I'd like us to delegitimize and defund the institutions that have broken American foreign policy in the first place. And I'd like us to accept that there are 7 billion people in the world and not all of them think like us and have the same history as us. You do those three things and I think we'll keep ourselves out of disaster and we may very well in this specific moment prevent America from getting involved in a nuclear war. Thank you all. So, Saurabh, how are we doing questions? Just people throw their hand up? Okay, I'll take a few questions. I'll take three questions, if anybody has one. I'll call on you if you don't have questions, so I'll make it very awkward. I go. Yeah, just... Sir. Well, I mean, most of them, I'd say. Um, the, the way that I think about this is, so there's about $1.7 trillion 
of foundation and university endowment wealth. Um, almost all of that, I mean, well over $1.6 billion of it is in explicitly left-wing institutions, okay? And yes, I think Harvard and Yale are explicitly left-wing institutions, right? Just to be clear about definitions. Um, I think that they've gotten such incredible wealth through highly preferential treatment in our tax system, okay? So very simply, what I'd like to do is stop treating foundations as effectively hedge funds that can't be taxed, okay? So like a very simple proposal, something you could do is maybe set a, you know, a cap on assets under management, maybe ever over $100 million of AUM or maybe $500 million, whatever cap you want to set, say, after that, any gains that you accumulate are treated like normal gains in the normal economy, okay? Um, I understand that we want some nonprofits, certainly a lot of, you know, I'm a practicing Christian, I believe that we should uh, have some carve out for churches uh, and, 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 you know, similarly situated nonprofits, but, you know, my church does not have a $500 million endowment, okay? Um, most American churches do not have that kind of preferential treatment, especially when you break it down to the parish, to the local church uh, level. But you have the Open Society Foundation with, what, 35 or $40 billion of AUM, the Harvard University Endowment with $42 billion of AUM. So I think basically we should not allow f foundations to rig the tax system in a way that no middle class American can take advantage of. And then, of course, they use that in incredible financial power for some pretty negative things. We have a question over here. Oh. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. I know you were uh, talking about the way that we in America need to take a second look at a lot of the institutions uh, in our country. And I wonder if that includes international institutions and specifically the NATO alliance. Do you think that the NATO alliance is a good thing? And that do you think the United States should remain a member of the NATO alliance? Or should it reconsider that? Well, I mean, the NATO alliance... In the abstract, I can see the argument that it's a good thing, but in practice, what does it actually do to us, right? I mean, I, I believe that Montenegro is one of the recent additions to NATO, okay? And there's this, this, this bipolarity, this two-sidedness to the agreement once you get into NATO. So the United States is now committed to defend Montenegro, and Montenegro, you'll all rest easy tonight, has committed to defend the United States of America, okay? Um, does that actually make any sense, especially in a world where Germany still doesn't spend, even, I think even now, given what's happened the last couple months, still doesn't spend 2% of its GDP on, on defense? No, it's kind of a joke, right? At the end of the day, uh, NATO can be a useful alliance if NATO members actually do the things that they're committed to doing. Uh, and until they do that, let's just all be honest with it. Let's be honest with ourselves that it's not actually serving an especially useful function, okay? Um, the, the thing that I find so preposterous about this whole Russia-Ukraine situation is NATO will admit to you, right? Like, we're being more hawkish on Russia in the, in the UK is maybe the sort of the one exception actually in Europe than the Europeans are, right? Because the Europeans know exactly what they're dealing with. Uh, their foreign policy establishment, while corrupt, is not nearly as corrupt as our own. Uh, and at the end of the day, they are thinking much more strategically about this situation than the United States is, okay? Uh, that suggests to me that using, um, using American power to do the dirty work of NATO, uh, to do the dirty work of, of Europe, is a pretty bad idea. And one last question. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what your assessment is of the size of the U.S. military. Should it be bigger? Should it be smaller? Is it the, si the right size? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we should spend more on technology and less on stupid wars, right? So, so may, maybe the, the, the overall defense spend is about right. Um, but if you look at the amount of money that we spend on defense and you compare it to China, you say, well, okay, the United States spends way more than China does. But if you cut out the cost of Iraq and Afghanistan, actually the Chinese start to look like they're catching up in a pretty, pretty significant way. So... My, my view here is, and, and we, you know, we've learned this the hard way in the last few weeks, uh, the Russians and the Chinese probably have better missile technology than the United States does right now, okay? That's insane. That, that, that is a really crazy fact of world affairs, uh, is that while we've been trying to train Afghanis in gender studies, the Chinese and the Russians have been developing hypersonic missiles, Okay, that seems sort of crazy to me. But again, if you look at foreign policy through a purely moralistic lens, we don't need hypersonic missiles. But, you know, those, uh, those kids in Afghanistan really need to, need to read, you know, Dr. Kendi um, and, 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 other, and other, you know, superstars of the American progressive movement. 
So I, I tend to think that we need to spend far less on military adventurism. We need to ask NATO to actually pick up the tab. We need to withdraw some resources from Europe at the end of the day, and we need to spend way, way, way more on technology development in this country. Um, that's, you know, look, China's 1.3 billion people. Uh, India is 1.1 or 1.2 billion people. The only way that we actually maintain our superpower status is we're, if we're ahead of the game technologically. And if we're not doing that, uh, then we're, we're in very, very deep trouble. And uh, that's, that's where I think I'd spend our resources. Okay. All so right. I said three questions. All right. Well, thank you guys. Great to be with you.